can turn in your Bible. You want to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, please? 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to talk about Jesus being our substitute. We're in the middle of March Madness. Well, almost at the end of it. There's a lot of substitutes going out on that floor, right? Others sit in the bench. The substitute comes off the bench and takes the place of the, the uh, first string player. That's nothing. That is nothing compared to the substitute that we have. In fact, that's almost an insulting uh, comparison. But I did want to begin by just turning your attention here to the suffering of our Lord in the uh, second chapter of 1 Peter. He is telling the people that he is writing to, Peter is, how they are to take the suffering that is being dished out to them by unbelievers. And he uses Christ as the example. He says in verse 21, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us. Christ suffered for you. Christ suffered for us. And in doing so, he not only suffered for us, but he left us an example. He left us an example that we should follow in his steps. And here it is. What's his example? Verse 22. He was sinless. He did no sin. Neither when he suffered, neither was guile in his mouth. He was a sinless substitute. There was no deceit about him. Everything he said was true. Verse 23, when he was reviled, and you know he was greatly reviled in his suffering. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. He didn't retaliate in like kind. When he suffered, he threatened not. Boy, not only did he not threaten, instead he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. In other words, when he suffered, he put himself in his father's hands. He realized that God was in control of every bit of the circumstances he was suffering. Verse 24, this is Jesus' suffering that is different than ours. Totally, here, verse 24. Who, Jesus, his own self, bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. That reminds me of Isaiah 53, doesn't it, you? All we like sheep have gone astray, right? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes. You know what the stripes are? When he was whipped by his stripes, we are healed. We are healed. I want you to understand something about your substitute, our substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ. What I want you to understand about him in just a, a few minutes of a devotional thought this afternoon, is that Jesus was different from any human being that ever lived because Jesus possessed both a divine nature and a human nature. Jesus was 100% God. At the same time, he was 100% man in the same person. That's unique about him. As the eternal son of God, Jesus had no beginning and had no and will have no ending. But as the incarnate son, as God in a human body, as the incarnate son, he is the son of David. We heard that this morning in the Haftarah. He is the son of David and he is the son of Mary and he is the Messiah and he had a beginning as the son of Mary, he had a beginning in both time and space. What I'm saying is simply this. 
your substitute and mine, it was absolutely important and necessary that he had to be fully man and fully God at the same time for his death for us to be effective. If he wasn't both God and man at the same time, then his death on the cross that we're remembering today in the Lord's Supper was ineffective or ineffective. He had to be more than a mere man, but he couldn't be less than fully a man. Both Jesus' deity, that is his godhood, and Jesus' humanity are a must when it comes to him being your substitute. So that's what I want to share. And I'm going to use that uh, word that he spoke on the cross when he said, it is finished. I'm going to talk about that as uh, relating to his deity. And then I'm going to use the words from the book of Hebrews, where the writer says that he came in the flesh. He came in flesh and blood. I'm going to use finished and flesh. Finished, his deity, flesh, his humanity, and see how that relates to Jesus being our substitute. Let's pray first. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus. Oh, what a, a wonderful work he accomplished. No other being could have ever accomplished what Jesus did. Certainly Adam, even if he was still in his perfection, couldn't accomplish what Jesus accomplished because of who he is. And we just ask that this afternoon, as we think about the wonderful substitute that our Savior is, that our hearts would be just moved and we would rejoice and we would have deep heart gratitude for all that he is and all that he's done as the one who stood in our place, who took on uh, human flesh, just like we, uh, just like us, and he took our punishment, as we've already read. He bore in his human body our sins up on that tree. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this. We pray. Amen. So let's let's uh, remember, first of all, that your substitute must be deity. He must be God. He had to be more. Listen, Jesus, in order to be your substitute, had to be more than even a, a, a sinless man. He had to be more than a sinless man. If he was only a sinless man, he could pay only for sin the way that human beings can pay for sin. God justly demands a payment for sin. And because our sin is against God, and God is eternal, then the payment for sin is an eternal payment. It's an infinite payment, which means it is absolutely impossible, even for a sinless man, it's absolutely impossible for a finite human being to ever pay off an infinite debt. Are you with me? Is your sandwich laying too heavy on your on your tummy? Do you understand what I'm saying? Your sin is against God, and God is eternal. And because God is eternal, then the debt that your sin owes is an eternal debt. And you and I aren't eternal. We're we're finite. And so we finite beings. We can't pay an infinite debt. And you know what? That's why when the Bible describes the place where unbelievers who reject Jesus go, that they are there eternally. The Bible talks about everlasting punishment. You know why it's everlasting? Because you can't ever pay it off. You never come to the end of paying it off because you can't pay it as a human being. An infinite debt. That's why 
the fire is described as an everlasting fire. But because Jesus is God, the payment completely satisfies the infinite demands of an eternal God's justice against your sin and mine. So that's why a man could never pay his or your sin debt. It takes God to do that. You got that point? Okay, simple. The second point, I'm going to use uh, Hebrews uh, Hebrews 2.14 for this. Because in Hebrews 2.14, the writer says, For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood. And he's talking about the children of God, or God's children. As much as children are partakers of flesh. You and I, by the way, the word flesh and blood in the Bible means human being, human nature. It's a, it's a term for human nature. When you see that term flesh and blood, uh, it means it's just an Old Testament uh, figure for a human nature. So it's, it's saying, for as much as human beings or the children are, are partakers of a human nature, flesh and blood, he also, that's Jesus, he also likewise took part of the same. He took upon himself flesh and blood. He took upon himself a human nature. Why? In order that through death, meaning on the cross, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who fear of death were their life, all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, don't misunderstand the word destroy in verse 14. It doesn't mean that at the cross, Jesus annihilated Satan. He's very much alive. What the word destroy uh, actually means is all of Satan's power and all of Satan's operations and works are really ultimately in the end useless. They're useless. He's really in the end powerless because you know what the ultimate result is? Satan is going to end up where? everlasting fire yeah exactly and so but the the point is here in hebrews 2 14 is that not only must your substitute be deity be god but your substitute must be humanity he must be fully man to be your substitute the only one who shares fully must have flesh and blood, our human nature. God as your substitute, Jesus as your substitute, he atoned for your sin because he was God and man in the same person. He atoned for your sin, and in doing so, he defeated Satan, we, we read here. But Jesus had to, be, had to be human because he actually came as the second Adam, you know what the first Adam did? He failed big time, right? He totally failed. In a perfect uh, garden paradise, he failed. Jesus comes into a deep, sinful earth as the second Adam, and he succeeds where the first Adam failed. Jesus, we read in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, bore your sin and paid for your sin, and Hebrews 2.14 says, as a result, you were released from sin's death grip. Sin, its power was broken, as well as Satan's power over you. And here's the thing. Turn for the last time to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Here is what God means by reconciliation. He reconciled us by his substitute, by being our substitute, by standing in our shoes, by taking our place and taking our punishment. <clears throat> by doing that, 2 uh, Corinthians 5 tells us he reconciled us who are out of sorts with God. He put us back. He reconciled us with God. And he says in that 21st verse, Paul says this, 
He, meaning the Father, no, Jesus, the Son, our substitute, he who knew no sin became sin for us. God the Father made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now that cuts totally against the grain of any human being ever, ever earning their way to heaven, earning their salvation. Because righteousness is not based upon what we do, but what he, our substitute, did for us. It's his righteousness that is the ticket to heaven. It's not my righteousness, nor yours. It's his right. There is a theological word. I want you to listen, because I want you to get this and not forget it. There's a big theological word that uh, really um, defines what it's saying there that he was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, that we are made the righteousness of God in him. The word is, are you ready? Imputation. Imputation. I-M-P-U-T-A-T-I-O-N. Imputation. Here's what it means. When Jesus was your substitute on the cross, God, when you when you receive Jesus, then God Im, imputed your sin to Jesus on the cross. He imputed your sin to Jesus on the cross. And when you receive Jesus, God imputes Jesus' righteousness to you. That's a great deal, right? That's a wonderful exchange. There's no comparison. My sin is what's weighing me down to hell. And my sin, all of it, the bulk of it, everything of my sin is imputed to Jesus as he hangs as my substitute on that tree. And when I believe that, and when I receive him as my Savior, then all, not my sin, but all God's righteousness, Jesus is God, right? All God's righteousness is then imputed to me is put to my account. The word impute means to put to someone's account. If we have accountants in this room, if you know anything about accounting, you know there's a there's a debit and a credit column, right? And so when you when Jesus died, all of your sins, all of your debits were put on his debit column. And when you receive him as your savior, all of his credits, all of his righteousnesses are put into your credit column. It's not your credits, it's his. Ming, you get this, right? Yeah. Ming's an accountant. This is what it means when he says, he who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's your substitute. He has to be man. He has to be fully human because a human being can't pay an eternal debt. It takes them forever. So he has to be God in order to pay the infinite debt that you and I owe because of sin. But he also has to be man because only a man can pay the debt for human beings. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, search all the world's religions. Is there any savior like that? Even ancient religions, is there any savior like that? All the all the mythology of the Greeks and the Romans, is there any god that comes close to that? <laughs> and all the modern uh, world religions, there is none that holds a candle to what we have in our substitute the Lord Jesus. He is the only God that actually left the glory and came down and became one of us, became a human being, and then went to the nth degree as a human being, bore all our sin in his body as he suffered and bled and died on that cross 
so that he could credit to our account all of God's righteousness. Now, what is left for you and I to do? <laughs> In a moment, we're going to sing Jesus paid it all. And now you know what you're singing. Now you know what it means. He took all your sin when he hung on the cross in your place as your substitute. And when you receive him, you get the totality of his righteousness. You think the righteousness of God ever runs out? He gets the totality of your sin and you get the totality of his righteousness. You understand? There's no debits left when you get God's righteousness. It's a wonderful thing. And that's what it means when he says, he became sin for us. The one who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. 